Welcome and thanks for joining us again this morning and to, to two of our very special guests um, who joined us, Fundi Chazabana, the Deputy Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Leila Fari, the CEO of the, of the JSE, and then to my own investor colleagues, Ruth Lees, the CEO of Investec Bank UK, Renee Fincel, Head of our Tax and Fiduciary Business, and Tersha Jacobs, our Treasury Economist. So welcome and really thanks for, for joining us today. I think for us, it's a very exciting opportunity to engage each one of you to share your very diverse experiences with us. And, and each one of you have achieved a significant amount in terms of your careers, in terms of the impact you've had on broader society. For us at Investec, we, we created these series of discussions to bring a diversity of views and to be able to engage people in a very open and, and an honest way and to share insights around a, very, a topic that I think is as relevant today as it was many years ago. And on that point, I wanted to quote from Sophie de Bruyne, who, who wrote an article in, in, in one of the weekend newspapers. And Sophie de Bruyne was one of the veterans of the 1956 march against laws enforcing black women to carry passes. And the one quote from, from that I wanted to use, which I felt is as relevant today as it was then, was where she said, and she quoted from the UN, she said, the UN has noted, that the profound shock of COVID-19 on our societies and economies underscores society's reliance on women, both on the front line and at home, and simultaneously exposed, is exposing structural inequalities across every sphere. In times of crisis, when resources are strained and institutional capacity is limited, women and girls face disproportionate impacts, with far-reaching consequences that are only further amplified in the context of, of the fragility of conflict and emergencies. Hard-fought gains for women's rights are also under threat. And when I read that paragraph over the weekend, actually when I read the article, but that paragraph struck me, again, with dear someone, a veteran of the 1956 march, quoting something that is as valid today as it was 64 years ago. And I think that, for me, would be one of the key threads as we pull through our debate and discussion today is to talk about the advances that have been made. And as much as gender rights have become entrenched, what hasn't become entrenched is equality. And how do we achieve that? That's one thing, having laws on books and legislation, but how do we actually achieve equality in the workplace? So I think those are some of the key themes I'd like us to, to touch on, as well as the impact of the pandemic and the opportunities presented by the pandemic. So before we, we get into to more detailed questions for, for each one of you, the one question that I, that I, would, I would pose to each of you, and, and maybe if I could start with you, Fundy, was what, what would you say, just to share some of your personal insights in, in, in the personal lessons you've learned and working through this pandemic, um, raising a family, dealing with a financial crisis that's been caused by a pandemic, um, your role particularly in, in, in the, at the Reserve Bank, at a very, very critical moment in its history where this is completely uncharted, unnavigated waters for us. So if you could share some of your insights and really appreciate hearing from you on that. Well, thanks, Kamesh. Thank you for inviting me. And ladies, it's it's lovely to be on this panel with you. And and I think I should commend Investec for this wonderful theme because most of the time we only see the end of something or the beginning of something. So lots of people would watch leaders making announcements. You don't really know what's happening in the background. So this idea of going behind the mask is, is one that, that appeals to me uh, quite a lot. So I thought that I, I should just share with you just a small picture of what I normally do every day. <laughs> so I, when I leave my house and I'm driving to the reserve bank, the little pieces of me get left behind. So the mom gets left at the gates of the Reserve Bank, the wife, the daughter, the Marvel fan, and here I arrive at, at, the, at a place that's quite central for macro policy making. And, and this is a way that I've trained myself because, you know, when, when you have to make some decisions, you have to take into account the facts in front of you. So yes, you are all of these other things in your life, but you I try to, to be objective in the way that I think about things. But what COVID-19 has done for me is it's actually allowed me to reform myself because I, I no longer have the gate of the Reserve Bank anymore. I'm like right here in this house. I wake up every morning 
And when the kids are going to school, I, I need to go through homework with them. I've, I've got to look at my husband. I've got to figure out what's going on. And in the early parts of the pandemic, I didn't have a helper. It was, um, I have to tell you, it was the most nerve-wracking thing because I didn't think about it. So let me relay the story as it starts, and, and Leila will remember parts of it, uh, starting on the week of the 15th of March. So all of us remember when the president was making that speech. But as all of those things were unfolding, I was planning for the IMF spring meetings that were around the corner. And, and the governor chairs the uh, one of the, the IMF committees, which is quite key in, 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 in making big decisions. So all of these conversations are happening, and this is a global pandemic. And, and so one of the things that we had to solve for was, what is it that we're going to put on the agenda of the international community? What are the decisions that have to be made? In that same week, it is the NPC blockout period where we're not talking to anyone. You're not talking to your friends. You're not talking to market participants. You really are wanting to be in a neutral space. Uh, you're reading newspapers, but you're not quite reading newspapers. You're not quite reading what analysts are saying because you want to have a very pure view of what's happening. And the market is in turmoil. So the <laughs> things start to happen. We're seeing... Uh, a lot of volatility in financial markets. And on the night before the NPC, we're starting to see things unravel. And, and the choices one had to make at that time is, what do we do? Do we finish the NPC conversation and, and announce the NPC decision and ignore what's happening in the market? But you can't talk to any market participants. You've got to obey your, your rules uh, of that time. And lots of people are calling and they say, why aren't you talking to us? Can't you see what's going on in the world? So long story short, we make the NPC decision. We don't have perfect information at the time. So if you recall, that was the first time that we announced that we were going to cut interest rates by 100 basis points, sort of like uh, unprecedented. On that evening, <laughs> we finished the NPC announcement. Uh, I have to call the a number of market participants, and we have to talk about what's happening in financial markets. And on the very next day, the Reserve Bank made some announcements on, on, on what, what we were going to do. So I have to think about what I'm going to do to do with my kids. So all of that is playing around in the background. How am I going to get my house clean? And all of that, I'm looking for a helper. And lo and behold, on the 22nd of, of March, we get a further announcement we're going into lockdown. So it's pretty clear now that these international meetings that I'm organizing are not going to be physical meetings. We can no longer travel. Uh, so this was COVID-19 for me. So I've had to reform myself, rediscover different things about myself uh, as part of this COVID experience so that I, I sort of see this fundi that's not just the deputy governor, but bringing all of these elements of myself together and, and figuring out how, how do I manage as a woman? How do I manage as a sister? My brother got a scare. He, he, his girlfriend got, got COVID. It was, you know, everything's happening while, while you also have to, to deal with work things at the same time because you're working from home. Uh, so that's my, my short story. I could go on for a long while, but I think I should stop there. Thanks for sharing that, Funny. I think that's, that brings a very personal view to, to, to your role. As much as we talk about opportunities and benefits of working from home, what we realize is that that work at actually during that period and even up to now in many cases has become boundaryless, and and your hours have extended and you never quite step away. And as you described driving to work, the one thing I realized was driving home from work was also creating some kind of divide. Although you always carry your work with you, but but driving out of a building, you're exiting that work frame of mind and you're starting to settle back into a home frame of mind when you don't have that. What's the impact on those around you, your family and yourself? Leila, I'd be keen to, to hear your views on, 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 on that as well and also having lived through that and, and, and obviously living through the, your role at, as CEO of the JC as, as a corporate entity itself, but also within the, the role, the broader mandate and fiduciary role that you play within the context of the JC itself through that period and how you, how you took it up. I'd be very keen for you to share your insights with us as well. 
Thank you, Kamish. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful privilege to uh, be able to speak alongside such esteemed and um, deeply experienced uh, female peers uh, in the industry. And I'm, I'm always very impressed by Investec's uh, constant curiosity and um, the, the number of really interesting panel topics um, that the bank offers. So it's uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, for me, I, I gained a lot of insight and, and I've probably grown more in, in the last uh, three months than I have over the course of my career in my both my personal and my work capacity. And um, there's a, a saying which is, uh, cometh the hour, cometh the man. And um, I, I think that post the World War, uh, Churchill and Franklin uh, D. Roosevelt were held up as, as heroes um, in the realm of leadership. And what came out of that terrible crisis, both the, the Depression and the war, was that women entered the workplace. And I think the difference now is that women are being held up as the heroes and the leaders. And, and so it is really a cometh the hour, cometh the woman. And I've, I've learned tremendously from so many international leaders, um, particularly leaders of state like Jacinda Ardern, who was a, a neighbor to, to the country um, that I was living in in Australia, um, Germany, Iceland, the Nordic countries, all of whom have had deeply successful leadership experiences uh, through the crisis and have demonstrated um, the courageousness with which women are able to lead. And um, the lessons that I took from them were lessons of empathy, decisiveness, and constant communication. When the crisis happened, and um, I was smiling as Fundi was talking because um, we had um, our own mini set of crises to deal with as each um, milestone unfolded. And I remember having a discussion with Fundi and a number of people at 11 p.m. one night. Um, and the big debate was um, whether we were uh, an essential service or not. Who else will be an essential service? Are all traders going to be deemed essential? Um, how do we ensure um, uh, we're open for business and we don't have an international crisis of confidence because the exchange is not able to operate. And, um, and so for me, in my personal business technical leadership domain, it was a tremendous journey of learning and humility and being open-minded. And I think the biggest characteristics um, important characteristics that see leaders through are an imagination and an ability to galvanize people. And so we had to imagine what the COVID lockdown environment was, was how, how it was going to unfold and what rules and regulations were required to enable appropriate trading. We had 750, 750% uh, increase in the number of um, circuit breakers that were triggered. Um, we had to preempt the work from home environment by three weeks. It's it's not an easy uh, uh, thing to get both the exchange, which is really driven off the back of a large tech enabler, um, together with all the traders, the buy side, the market data uh, people, and and just the practicality of getting everybody up and running was a tremendous feat. And our um, Chief Risk Officer is a female, and she did a phenomenal job in herding the cats, me, me included. And um, what, what transpired after that for me was I was most concerned initially about um, making sure that we were resilient and we were open for, for trading. And then once we had moved over that hump, my, my gaze shifted to the well-being mental well-being of our staff and I was quite concerned about the corporate identity and we put an enormous amount of activities in place to try and encourage connectivity. Um, we had chosen to, to pay our small vendors and so I, I challenged the team to think creatively about how they can use them and our, um, our HR head um, uh, uh, got one of our, our caterers to give cooking lessons to the children of our staff. 
And that was just one small example that genuinely um, included people. And we did a survey halfway through the lockdown, and I was quite struck by how responsive everybody was with the fact that we did small things like yoga classes for the for the whole organization online, um, small things like providing a little um, a, a top up to to staff for those people who needed to go and buy a new chair uh, to sit at their desk and um, sort out a mouse and and things that they hadn't hadn't had to deal with pragmatic things. On a personal level, I, I also um, developed tremendously. In fact, today it's my son's birthday, and I haven't seen them for seven months. Uh, because they're in Australia, and that that was a tremendous thing to to get used to, and and I think what people have struggled with most is the uncertainty, and the inability to predict when this is going to end. When are my children going to go back to school? When am I personally going to be able to hop on a plane and go and see my children? Um, when are we going to be back in the office in a in a normal working environment? Thanks very much for sharing those insights, Lala. The, the one that you make about some of the insights learned, which could help us perhaps reframe the way we look at participation of women in the economy going forward, is something I certainly want to come back to, um, I, I think, as, as a separate question, because I think that the old saying about never wasting a crisis, um, there's an opportunity that's been created here, and how do we take that up, and particularly from a gender perspective. But, but before we go there, I'd like to, to ask Ruth to weigh in on, on, on the same question and just to share some of her insights from the UK and, and leading a bank in the UK during this period. Thanks, Ruth. Hi, Kamesh. Hi, everybody. And uh, thank you to Fundi and, and Leila so far. I look forward to hearing from Rene and Tersha as well. And thank you for the, you know, the kind words about Investec. We, we do pride ourselves on, on being refreshingly human. And I think this crisis has certainly in fact, brought out the best in, in terms of the human spirit. And we have also seen, you know, some downsides of that, you know, certainly come through. Kamesh, you know, in some of the, the preparation for today, there were some words around, you know, how do you manage the balance? I think, and I'm sure everybody will break out into large smiles. I, I don't think there has been such a thing called balance uh, in the last few months. It is certainly, if I listen to the words, uh, used by my colleagues on the panel, the words like unprecedented, uh, like survival, like resilience, I'll add uh, stamina, but certainly, you know, as women, as anyone, uh, through this situation, something has to give. And I think, you know, one cannot strive for perfection uh, through times like this, but certainly we need a good plan for today, you know, rather than a perfect plan tomorrow. And, you know, that has definitely been a sense of the learning. A coming together of, of everybody around the world, uh, around the community, around the bank has been incredible, uh, certainly supported by everybody. I think we certainly did not prepare for this particular crisis, uh, for this pandemic, so to speak. Uh, as Fundi will know, uh, the Reserve Bank and Central Banks put us through a number of stress tests. We do our own stress testing. And I will say, you know, having been in the role of chief risk officer before, being in CEO, we certainly stressed everything up and down and round about and thought about just about everything. But I, I will put up the white flag and say we certainly did not stress for pandemic. So without the playbook, we were not prepared for this, but we were prepared for something. And I think that's how, you know, Investec and other banks certainly went into this, which was very, very different from how we entered 2008, uh, 2007, 2008 where banks' balance sheets were certainly not resilient at that time or certainly didn't hold the capital and liquidity buffers that, that we hold today. So the human impact this time has been, you know, really tremendous and, and quite different from what we endured before. And if you say, you know, what have I learned? Well, I've certainly learned how to source everything online. <laughs> and uh, the only person I was seeing in the first weeks of this crisis outside of our household was the Amazon delivery. Um, that would arrive each day where I'd rush to the door with a huge smile on my face, just happy to see someone else. So I rushed out of the office on the 11th of March with a call from my husband saying he's at the hospital, he has pneumonia. Things moved very, very quickly. And uh, that was the beginning for me. So quite really early on, um, things were fine kind of with that until Friday morning, uh, my first daughter woke up with a fever. And then I did start to, you know, just have that feeling of, you know, OMG, you know, what's going to happen next? And uh, on Saturday, the other two children went down. 
I thank God that the, this was a relay in that everybody went down, you know, kind of uh, individually. And by the time my husband recovered, that was when, when I took ill. And uh, you mentioned cooking classes, Layla, but my 15-year-old son, boy, did he develop cooking skills, chicken, fish, you name it. But that is one of the other positives that, that has happened is that everybody had to weigh in, you know, step in and do things. From the daily walks, my, my son would drag me out to, you know, in every evening, as you all described, endless days with no end really. But the simplicity that this has brought back, the happiness to be found, you know, really in, in, in your own home, in your own family, you know, for those who've been able to find it, you know, that simplicity of life, slowing down, taking a look, thinking about things with a different perspective has certainly you know, been a positive, you know, through this whole experience. So everything you are all saying, the tracksuits, uh, I was quite happy when my children were wearing pyjamas every day, although I said it's not great to appear in your pyjamas every day for school. I was quite happy because it was far less to wash <laughs> uh, and certainly reduced uh, the load. But we've all had our experiences and listening to you, I'm humbled by, by, by what you've all been through. You know, we all think we're at the epicenter of it. But I think across the organization, everybody, the vulnerability, you know, and, and we also went through the experiences, you know, not only around gender, but around race. And I think also, you know, the the um, the raw nerve that was really struck, you know, through the incidents uh, with George Floyd, another incident, you know, in, in this regard. But again, people were open now to be able to listen, acknowledge, understand. We've had a number of conversations in Investec where people have opened their humanity, starting to listen, starting to acknowledge. And I think both on race and gender, when people understand your perspective because they're able to get into your shoes and see what it feels like to be you, either as a woman or either as a person you know, of a different race or colour, it does make a difference in terms of how we can actually bring about positive change going forward. Thanks. Tisha, I'm, I'm, I was going to ask you a very similar question, just, just in terms of your role um, as a, an economist in this period, advising the bank, advising clients. Um, clearly, everyone was looking for some guiding light during this period, and many turned to the economists. And I know you're not the only economist on this call. I know, I know Fundi is also an economist by training, but I'd be interested to just some of your personal insights and then also just, just sharing, sharing um, your views from a macro perspective during the pandemic. The, the sort of advice that was being being sought from you and, and just some of your general thoughts around that. Thanks, Tisha. Hi, Kamish, and thank you for this panel and thank you for the great insights that um, Ruth and Fundi and Leila have shared so far. Um, yes, I think perhaps I can just highlight, you know, what stood out to me is, you know, how people adapt, um, you know, and also, you know, after the, the frenzy of the first couple of months as the lockdown in South Africa has been extended, you know, he's also started to have some time and then that led to introspection. And you also realize that life is not going to be as usual. You actually have to start adapting in a better way to start living a full life, you know, that where you've got hope. Um, so it also led to a lot of introspection. Um, you know, so what can we learn out of the situation? So, you know, it's actually been as it as much as it was challenging, it also gave us new perspective. So I think, you know, going you can't go back to the person that you was prior to to the crisis as well. I think from the economic side, I mean, you know, it was an exogenous shock and which spilled over to the real economy. And, you know, this has instigated the, the biggest downturn since we've seen since the depression in the 1930s. And, you know, unfortunately, um, women, you know, there's been a lot of job losses and, you know, businesses that have been closed across the spectrum. But job losses um, among women has been very high. And we also know, and Kamish, you pointed it out earlier on, is that women actually do form the backbone of society. And I think in terms of the opportunities, which you are going to touch on later, um, it does offer manifold opportunities for women to, for especially the inclusivity and the gender diversity. Um, and also, I think for, you know, for careers that will not be interrupted if, for example, women would like to start a family. So there are definitely many opportunities spinning off from this. I think as far as the economy is concerned, um, you know, these, there's a very high level of uncertainty. We have seen in America, in Australia, in the UK, and in countries in Europe where there's not an increase in tourism, that where the virus has picked up again, there's been some restrictions again that has been imposed. So this kind of 
um, crisis that we are experiencing is going to be very much stop go. So you really don't know what tomorrow holds. Thanks very much for that, Tosh. I know you've, you've also raised a couple of issues that I'd also like us to pick up. I'm conscious that we, you know, we don't have lots of time. And, and that's the nice thing about this sort of panel discussion is so many views emerge and there's so many other avenues of debate that I think we'd like to pursue. And hopefully if we can't cover it all in this session, we will in time cover, cover more of the topics raised. But, but thanks for sharing those insights, Tosh. Renee, just from your perspective, um, the same question, you know, running the business through this period, but I'd actually also like you to perhaps bring a slightly different slant to it, given, given your very specific role from a trust and fiduciary perspective. And, and certainly what we saw from a client engagement was people suddenly concerned about the fragility of life, about actually planning, about understanding what you need to do to protect your family, to protect yourself. Things, you know, I think the, the universe is probably sending us a deeper, broader message that will take time for us all to understand. But in your role as a tax and fiduciary specialist, and also talking to, to, to particularly women-run households, many women-owned businesses, many single-parent, single-women-parent homes, et cetera, just some of your insights around that, because I think that's something that's quite topical, not just for our panel, but for, for, for um, our clients who, who are dialing in to listen to this, if you don't mind sharing some of that. So it's a broader question, and keen to, to hear your insights. Thanks, Renee. Great. Thanks, Kamesh. So I think firstly, you know, people tend to put their personal planning on the back burner. And I think, you know, it might be an old cliche, but the only certainty in life is death and taxes. And I think COVID did highlight, you know, how fragile life is. And we were incredibly busy dealing with clients in fear of getting COVID and passing away. So we actually found that COVID highlighted the importance of proper estate planning, you know, not only for, um, for males, but more specifically for females. Because we all know they are the driver behind the more emotional part of estate planning. Um, and often we focus on the financial part of it, but there's a big emotional part of what will happen to the kids if something happens to me. Will dad know what they like? What, you know, what time do we bath them? What school should they go to? What career should they follow? So we actually, you know, we had to guide clients and hold their hands, um, especially in the first period where they wanted to draft wills. And we all know you need to witness wills. People benefiting from the estate can't witness. So we had so many phone calls from clients in a big panic, asking us, how do I sign this will? What do I do? Do I have enough liquidity in my estate? Who do I appoint as my guardian? Can I introduce my wife to my banker? Because she's got no idea of the, you know, the financial implications of my estate. Because the reality is, from a female perspective, is we tend to have you know longer longevity than Males, we tend to live longer. At the end of the day, you, you, you may inherit your um, husband's entire estate. And at the end of the day, you will then decide how the disposition of your assets will, will happen at the end of the day. So I think a big drive for us was education. And even though our tax and exchange control regimes are gender neutral, um, it's an equal playing field. We f sometimes find that the biggest hinder is, you know, education and communication of exactly what the consequences are, especially for females. Um, and I think that was one of the biggest positives that COVID um, brought to our industry, where people actually thought about the things that they never think about. You don't wake up on a Monday morning thinking, when will death knock on the door? So I think this was a big driver to make sure that people actually prepare during their lifetime and not just leave everything for for the spouse to deal with. Thanks, Renee. That's certainly, I think, firstly, I think you've shared some insights that to many of us may have been initially overlooked um, in terms of the, the realities that people face and the fragility of life. And, and then be forced to, to take steps that often we probably, many of us, are guilty of, of deferring because you know, there's always going to be another day to deal with it. Um, but this certainly has brought it home. The one question that I'd like to move on to, and, and Leila, I'm going to di direct this to, to you, but I think it will be for anyone else on the panel that also wants to weigh in, was, was something that, that when I say I was surprised, I, sp I probably realized it did exist, but I didn't realize the extent of it, was the, the gender pay gap. When, when I had a quick review of the PwC's 2020 Executive Director's Remuneration and Trends Report, it highlighted quite a significant gender pay gap again. 
Um, and and I think what what, what it sort of the, just the, the summary that I'd looked at was saying that within the JSE, the, from a large cap to mid cap to small cap, the the, the gaps actually were, were wider at the large cap, uh, more reduced at the mid cap, and then lower in the smaller entities. Um, but but at the at the at the large cap level, as wide as forty five percent. And I'd be interested just to hear your your thoughts about that. You know, in, in this day and age, again, we talk about gender rights, but we don't seem to have got equality. And 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 that's the key thing for me is it's fine paying lip service to it and ticking a box, but how do we actually make sure that people are being paid equal equal pay for equal work? As simple as that. So I'd be keen to hear your views on that and, and as well for any of the other panelists who are keen to weigh in. Kamesh, this is, is, is a real problem um, and it's endemic across the world. Um, the World Economic Forum predicts that it will take more than 250 years based on the rate of change that we've seen over the last uh, couple of, the last uh, decade or two uh, for that gender pay gap to narrow. And um, particularly in countries that are emerging markets like South Africa, it's, it's a genuine problem. And um, so, so I think we as leaders need to use our voices to demonstrate and to shift that narrative. Um, in 1972, um, Billie Jean King, the um, tennis player, won the, uh, un the uh, US Open. And after she won, she discovered that she had earned $15,000 less than her counterpart, and um, she uh, uh, made a, a pretty public um, display and said that she would not be participating the next year if that gender pay gap wasn't, uh, if, if she, her, her pay wasn't equalized. And so they equalized uh, the pay gap, and, um, uh, and, and it, it was the first large-scale um, sporting event that paid equally for, for different genders. And, and so I think the onus is on individual companies, not only, not only female leaders, male and female leaders alike, to ensure that that pay gap is narrowed. One of the contributors to that, unfortunately, is that um, women end up, as, as the primary caregiver, taking leave. And particularly if they work in areas like technology or very fast-moving areas, um, they, they exit the workforce for a few years. And when they come back, their skills are, are outdated and their salary then tends to reflect that. So it's not only by level, but also there are, are, are systematic structural inequalities in the way in which um, we engage. Um, so, so I do think the, the pay gap is, it, it's really important that we as leaders take that seriously. And I think that what needs to happen is, is that it, it needs to be more explicitly measured um, across uh, uh, both listed and unlisted entities, and it needs to be publicly disclosed. And only when those numbers are explicit and in the public domain, I think, will we start to see action being taken. So um, this is definitely the next major. If, if the first uh, big drive was to get women in the workplace, um, most countries have achieved that. Um, the next will be to to reduce the gender pay gap and to ensure that that um, leaders are, are equally represented um, across gender. I read in uh, a quote the other day that actually I love, and I think it's something um, that I've actually done. You get what you want by gentle pressure, relentlessly applying. And I think it's something that <laughs> females are no, great pretty. at. Yeah, and I think, again, you, you might have to fight harder for something, but I think it's the way that we do it. It's gentle pressure, but we do it relentlessly. And I think it's something that we can, you know, learn from each other a lot. Thanks, Renee. I, I, I know, you know, I think just, just as, as, as we peel into layers into this, these topics, you realize there's so much more we can cover. And in fact, we need a lot more time. But um, I'm conscious of the fact that, that that time is against us. And I wanted to to just, I think the, the one question I said I'd come back to was, as we look ahead and lessons learned from this pandemic and the opportunity to, to reframe, remold, and as we rebuild 
the economy in many parts. How do we take some of those lessons and productively use them to make sure that from a gender perspective, we're able to, to, to rebalance and rebuild in a way that hopefully creates a new normal for us? Um, so I'd like you to share just some of your, your, your thoughts on that. Um, I know some of whom, some of you who I chatted to over the last day or two were the sort of lessons we've learned around things we thought could never be done in a flexible work environment. Now, I know from an investor perspective, during the course of the last 18 months, we'd, we'd actually shifted to a flexible leave policy, a flexible dress policy, and a number of other things. But the one thing I don't think we thought would be possible was that, that 95% of our workforce could work from home. And the last few months has actually shown us that that is possible. And as we look at women who are raising families, women who are running households, who have multiple responsibilities other than their day job, what has this created for potentially that we can take forward as hard lessons learned that give us different ways to remold the firms that we work for and to make sure that we can create a far more inclusive work environment? So I'd, I'd be keen to, 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 uh, for you to share some of your parting thoughts on that. Fundi, if I could start with you, perhaps. Sure. Um Thanks very much, Kamesh. Certainly having these digital platforms like WebEx for me, I, I think has revolutionized the, the central bank. <laughs> um, and, and central banks by their nature are quite bureaucratic. And, and so having these, um, these, these virtual meeting spaces has allowed us to get uh, at least to go down one or two steps lower, uh, levels lower in terms of getting people involved and in understanding the conversation. The other thing that, that struck me, and, and Leila touched on this, is just how innovative we have to be to ensure that we maintain this corporate identity. And, and it really tests us in, in deciding what it is that we want to uh, what we want to be top of mind and what is the organizational culture and what it is that we have to do to live it. So very early in the crisis, it became quite clear that, look, uh, you can either utilize these tools to, be, to continue to be bureaucratic and just have a top layer that is aware of what's going on. But if you are faced with a one, once in a hundred year event, You've got to be very decisive on exposure, on how you're going to teach, on how you're going to mentor people. And, and that's something that's been quite important and, and quite revealing uh, for us as well, just to do as an organization. And, and I see so many ideas out there. Ruth was talking about the Amazon box arriving at her doorstep. In South Africa, that's still very rare. It's not the norm. And, and I see this as, as a new opportunity for newer businesses to be restarted, to be reformed as part of this crisis in terms of what are the new areas of, of work that, that need to be done. But we also need to think about how do we take care of the vulnerable as a state. Thanks, Fundi. That's very, very useful insights. Thanks, Leila, if you don't mind weighing in next. Sure. Um, I think what this crisis has highlighted uh, for me is the need to, to genuinely equalize the responsibilities between men and women, and particularly in the workplace. There was a study done by the New York Times, and they found that 70% of women during the lockdown were responsible for um, housework. 66% of them were responsible for childcare and 80% were responsible for homeschooling. And I spent three years in Australia. And when I came back, it was quite a stark uh, awakening for me to see that the women in the domestic environment tend to pick up the slack and do most of the house-related uh, activities and responsibilities, and many of the people who are, are watching this um, uh, this panel are, might be single mums, and many might have young kids at home. My kids are, are much older and independent now, but I can only imagine the kinds of of stresses that um, that that 
they would be experiencing. I've, I've been trying to keep my little kitten at bay here um, as I'm, I'm talking, and I can only imagine if that was a two-year-old child who decided he wanted his bottle. Um, so I think that there needs to be a cultural awareness, and um, organizations need to put in place structures that help women to manage their personal demands in the workplace. And um, we we introduced at the JSC something that um, kind of went a little bit viral. I was really surprised at, at how, how much attention it grabbed and appeared to be um, a policy that was driven for men. And this was that we provided four months equal um, paternity leave for men as we did for women. And rather ironically, um, that 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 enhances and enables women in the workplace more than it does men, because the full the message we are sending is that the full responsibility for parenting doesn't exclusively lie with the women. Just because women carry their babies around for nine months in their body doesn't mean that that. Um, uh, oversight and caregiving responsibility is exclusively the domain of women. And so I think more needs to be done culturally and more sensitivity needs to be um, considered um, for, for women. And it's the softer issues in addition to, of course, all the hard policy issues. Um, like Ruth had, had, had mentioned, the UK government has done a lot in in explicitly legislating equality of women in the workplace. It's about ensuring that meetings aren't held um, after hours or at very early um, times when mothers might be taking their children to school. Um, it's about forgiveness when children are sick and just in a, giving them a little bit more slack. I do think the work from home environment is going to provide a, um, a very uh, genuine uplifting effect um, to women because it gives us more flexibility. And, and I, rather ironically, I think the productivity increases. Um, but I do think that the more women you have in senior leadership positions, the more empathy and understanding we will have. And so ultimately, we really do need to, to get that senior leadership um, uh, inequality and inequity uh, rebalanced. Thanks very much, Lola. I think I think there the, the, the have been lots of lessons learned, and I think as as we look forward, um, this kind of debate, this kind of platform, starts highlighting the responsibility in all of us, men and women out there in leadership roles and just roles in these organisations. And I think one of the points that um, Fundi made, and and I think also building on what you had said, Lola, was was around. The, for people and women in these roles, balancing that level of self-confidence and self-doubt and being able to assert yourself and 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 demand in the, in, in the best possible way and, and not necessarily in a confrontational way, but what is right. Because it's not just about your role, it's about those that follow you into these roles that come and, and the platform that we create for many others. And I think that's a lot of a part of these kinds of debates is to stimulate that and to allow people to think differently about their own roles every day and the way they take it up. So thanks for sharing that. I just before we we round off, I wanted to give Renee, uh, Ruth, and uh, Tertia any of your your parting comments before we we close out. I'm conscious of the fact that we've run over time a bit, but be keen to to hear any any parting thoughts. Thanks very much, Commission. Thanks again uh, to everybody who's participated here today. It's it's been as I said earlier, really humbling listening to to everybody's stories. I think one benefit that has arisen is that there's an awareness in the home, as Fundi refers to. Um, for partners to see what actually does go on, you know, what are the other responsibilities that are taking place. And I think hopefully when that gets come back to whatever the new normal is in terms of the office home blend going forward, that some of that empathy may have been, you know, transferred to others who have had now their eyes opened and an awareness, uh, you know, for what is actually, what actually goes on in the home. I think from my side, yes, thank you very much. And I found all your views and your insights um, very worthwhile to listen to. Um, and I think what stands out for me is that, you know, in this kind of knowledge economy, um, you know, technology definitely empowers. Um, this boundaryless, um, you know, economy, I think will be able to draw more women in. 
Um, and as Leila also pointed out, the flexibility is going to be very important. And I feel that in this environment, as we said, it is challenging. But, you know, there's more potential that, that can be achieved with, within women. I was fortunate enough to see my little one-year-old crawl for the first time, walk for the first time, say mama for the first time. And, you know, at that age, they don't understand, close the door, I've got a meeting. So I had a few embarrassing um, incidents, as many of us did. So, yeah, I think I'm humbled for the whole pandemic and I'm really excited to see what, um, you know, what lies ahead for women in business. Thanks very much, Renan. And thank you to, to our, our outside guests. Thanks so much, Fundi, Leila. We realize you both have very hectic diaries, a very difficult time in the economy, both playing critical roles to, to have made the time available to us and, and to join us and our clients and our staff in, in this platform and debate. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to end with a quote that I read early this morning. It actually was from Camilla Harris, who Joe Biden has, has chosen as his vice presidential running mate. But I think it, it, it wasn't just about an American story. It was just something that struck me that resonated with the topic of, for this debate, where she said, my daily challenge to myself is to be part of the solution, to be a, part, to be a joyful ba- warrior in the battle to come. My challenge to you is to join that effort, to stand up for our ideals and our values. Let's not throw up our hands when it's time to roll up our sleeves. Not now, not tomorrow, not ever. And I think that's the message for us. As, as, as people leading in businesses, playing a role, when we're talking about gender rights, diversity and inclusion, that we make sure that we don't throw up our hands. And when we, when we listen to some of these quotes, you listen to the gender pay gaps, you listen to unfair treatment of people based on race, gender or class, I think the onus is on all of us to step up, step up to the plate and leading the way we should. And to those of us who can play that role, I think that's a significant responsibility. So thanks again for joining us and uh, really been great hosting this, this panel discussion. I just wish we had four more hours because I think there's so much more we could cover. So thank you again. Mm-hmm.